Welcome to our podcast series, Talking with Traders, hosted by expert trader Garth McKenzie in London, from where he's interviewing various guests on the topic of trading. Welcome back to Talking with Traders. This is the fifth season of the podcast to take us up to the end of 2022. Thanks to all our loyal listeners for returning and welcome to all our new listeners. As before, IG Markets have come on board as sponsors of this podcast. We're truly grateful to have such an award-winning CFD provider as sponsor alongside us. In this season, I'll welcome back some guests from the previous seasons of the podcast to get their updated market views, and we'll also be bringing in some new guests to the microphone too. As always, the aim with these podcasts is to give you the opportunity to listen to differing market views and to assist you with your own trading and investing education. So with that in mind, let's get straight into another episode of Talking with Traders. Welcome back to another episode of Talking with Traders. This is the second episode in season five of the podcast series. And for this show, we've got a new guest. It's Ernest Kaplan. And uh, Ernest and I go back a little way. We've been at the Financial Mail Awards together, and I'm happy to say that Ernest did way better at the at the awards than what I did. <laughs> Ernest, you're the number one rated analyst in the computing and electronic sector for 2022, and you've also been rated uh, in the top five for the last 17 consecutive years. And what's most impressive about all of this is that you're an independent analyst. You're not representing one of the big stockbroking firms or the institutions or the banks. You're totally independent, and yet you're ranked number one in the computing and electronics sector of the JSE. So it's it's a hell of an accolade. Welcome to you and welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Garth. I appreciate the wonderful introduction. And yeah, it's 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 great to uh, to be recognized after many years of hard work. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Thanks very much. Yeah, super. I mean, it's 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 quite an achievement. As as we were saying previously, you know, yourself and and Anthony Clark are really two guys that I think of as independent analysts that have really uh, shone in the South African uh, financial markets community. In the sense that you're both independent analysts and you and and yet you're so highly rated. I mean, but I guess you've carved a niche for yourself in the space that you're in, right? Yeah, look, I mean, Garth, you, you know what? Um, there aren't many um, independent um, analysts in South Africa. It's a really tough um, area to to uh, to crack it and, and to do well. And the main reason is because you're up against big teams uh, of analysts and salespeople that are, are kind of designed to to push their message uh, through the system, whereas, whereas independents like me uh, are, are limited in what I can do. Um, and, so, and so what I need to do is I just need to know the companies um, better than anyone else. And mm. I'm not saying I do, but I, I've, got a, I've got a very, I think, quite an established industry network. And because I also do consulting work in the industry, I think I'm in touch with things on the ground, perhaps better than an 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 an, an average uh, sort of typical um, analyst who kind of always looks at at things from a from an analyst point of view. Mm. So I think that has helped me a lot. Um, plus, I've got a, a a very big passion for it, and and certainly for the people in the industry. And uh, you know, some of my contacts go back 20 years. And, and they've gone on to become leaders in their respective uh, organizations and companies and all over the world. South Africans are, are hell of a successful, as you know, mm. everywhere in the world. So in the UK, in America, Australia, in Europe. And, and every, every week I, I look at my, my contacts and I discover somebody that I thought was 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 doing something, but actually that person's doing something else in a different country, and it's quite it's quite amazing. And then you chat to them and find out what's going on, and you pick up new things, and all that knowledge kind of goes into my research, and and uh, and and I enjoy it. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Tell us a little bit about your background, though, Ernest. Cause you're you're an electrical engineer by training, right? Yeah. So. 
I studied electrical engineering um, at Wits after school, and and I, I, I enjoyed that tremendously. It was a it was a fantastic um, uh, course um, when I did it, and and still is today. And and I think why it was good for me was because I was always strong in maths and science, and and I liked that type of thing. Uh, you know, uh, I, it was either that or becoming a doctor, and 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 I chose that. Uh, I think it played better to my strengths. Mm-hmm. And and then I spent a couple of years working in the in the actual IT industry, mm-hmm. and um, many of or quite a few of those years were with a, a wonderful, wonderful company called the Internet Solution, oh, yeah. which which went on to to do great things and. It it was acquired by Dimension Data, and um, you know they basically were 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 the leading corporate uh, ISP in South Africa. They brought the internet um, to South Africa, and just to give your listeners a flavour of the times, we're going back to 1996, 97, when the internet was coming out. Uh, in South Africa, yeah. you'd go to a client and want to sell them an internet line or internet access, um, and I would sometimes join one of the one of the people. And it was funny because they would say, "Yeah, but what am I going to use this for?" And you would say, "Well, it's you can email people." And the <laughs> the, the, the feedback would be, "Okay, but who am I going to email?" <laughs> it's like it's it's like if you get the first fax machine, who are you going to fax? Yeah. So. You know, th- this was early days, and uh, look at where where we've come from then. But I think what what was great for me, other than the, that, it was a great company, is it's it solidified quite a few um, strong relationships with um, really amazing people that that I worked with at the time. And those people are not all at Internet Solution, but they've all gone on to do wonderful things. I mean, you know. Um, become very senior in in the data and NTT structures mm. to people moving on, like one of the people who I had good relationships with in those days, Derek Wilcox, is now the CRO of Discovery. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's those types of relationships that you just keep on, you know, keeping in touch with, of those, with those people. Then I started studying the CFA program and the whole world of, equity research opened up uh, to me and my eyes went very big and 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 I, and I started uh, I left the IT industry which was a big decision for me at the mm-hmm. time and I got a job at um, Societe Generale the French investment bank um, working under David Shapiro right. and uh, Nico Chapionka um, and and I was doing IT research and the interesting part of that whole story is it was a couple of months before the dot com bubble burst. Mm. So, you know, it was I guess they say your 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 um your your investment personality is typically forged in the first few years of what of your professional career in that industry. And in my case, you know, I didn't really understand what was going on, but you know, we just saw this monstrous crash happening. Mm. And then I was promptly moved to the world of telecoms because RT was not was not um, was not was not the flavor of the year. So so I did I did telecoms and in those days it was MCL and Venfin. And that's where I cut my teeth as an analyst. And mm-hmm. then we all got retrenched. And and so I went independent for a while thinking you know, I would maybe find another job soon, but at that point in time, there weren't any jobs, and and so I just continued the independent um, route and built it up from strength to strength over the years. And here I am, twenty years later, oh, uh, continuing fantastic. on. So, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. What I love about the independent nature of it as well is that you're not necessarily um, clouded by. A big institutional house view, which I—I I mean, I know it sometimes can happen where analysts, uh, you know, you maybe can't say certain things about a certain company because the bank that they work for has a special relationship with that company, etc. So you kind of wonder how independent the research really is that these 
people are putting out. Whereas you're totally independent. You don't, yeah, you don't have to kowtow to anybody or any greater house view and and worry about those types of things. I guess. Yeah, um, I think that is one of the main advantages of being independent. And I mean, most people who 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 know me will will say that my research is quite balanced. Um, I'm I'm not. I'm not the type of person that tries to create a sensation about something. Um, but when I do see something that is clearly wrong or, or, or an opportunity, then, then I will, um, then I will make, make a bit of noise about it. Mm. But, but, uh, but I'm generally quite a conservative um, analyst and I like to see the full picture, do a hell of a lot of work, um, maybe weeks of work just to realize that, I only write one sentence about that issue. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I spend a lot of time trying to understand what's driving things, what what's happening behind these companies. And later on in my career, appreciating that it's people that drive things. And and it's, you know, you can analyze these companies as, as inanimate objects, yeah. like we call, you know, companies. But at the end of the day, it's people and people buy from people. So yeah. if you if you understand the people well and you and you understand what's what's making them wake up at in the morning and go to work and what's keeping them up at night, you get a better idea of of where companies are going to be going over the future. Mm. So I, I, I like that side of it a lot um, in the past sort of five or 10 years. Okay. So what we want to do now is get into the sort of the meat of this discussion, I guess, and let's talk about some of the companies that you cover. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the companies in South Africa, which is really where your, I know your real strength is. Um, but then we'll also venture offshore a little bit because I know you have been becoming more and more a fay with a, lum- a number of the tech companies on the offshore market. And I think that's in, at a very interesting time right now, given the the weakness that we've seen in the tech sector it, offshore over the last year. But let's start quickly with uh, with the South African market. I mean, you, you do cover quite a few companies in that computing and electronic space. As you, you said to me off the call that the sector, the industry has been shrinking a bit just because of delistings in South Africa and some of the companies have become a lot smaller. But two of the companies that you cover, which I'd like to chat to you about are EOH and Roynet. Um, and I, I was thinking a moment ago, you're saying, you know, you, you'd like to know from the management what gets them up in the morning or what keeps them awake at night. EOH is a company that would have been keeping a lot of people awake at night over the last couple of years because it's it's really not um, – you know, it's, it's fallen away. It's shrunk into a, a, a shadow of what it used to be in terms of a stock that once was – I think it peaked at 180 rand – and now it's down at like five or six rand a share. But let's chat a little bit about EOH and wh- what you think there as a as a stock, as an opportunity for investment, and you know maybe give the listeners a little bit more color on it from your perspective. Oh, thanks, Garth. Um, look, EOH is a very interesting one because it's a company that I started analyzing when I think there were one or two rand a share mm. on the way up. Many years back, there were there were I think only about fifty people in the company, and um, and it was a, a, a couple of CFOs before the one that that is there now, mm. and um, and it was it was started by by Asher Bobbitt and and um, a couple of his partners, and they had a fantastic grasp of of what was going on in the largely in the software area that affects manufacturing and uh, and that space and and they built it out into a very broad sort of IT services group mm-hmm. you know in south africa uh, goth most of the of the listed companies are in the tech space are typically um you know uh, 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 selling third party intellectual property i.e. software from from overseas um, largely in America, actually, and and then adding on the local service component to right. to install that software, get it working, and keep it going. Mm. And 
And that's really what EIH did very successfully for many years. And we all know that, that they were able to keep um, their growth um, up through acquisitions that were done very smartly, um, yeah. paying pretty low multiples, and, um, and, and the share price was going up. And these um, little companies that were, that were acquired were, were, were eventually, um, you know, the, the, the founders of those little companies became very wealthy over time. So yeah. the, the whole story kind of, um, or, or the whole journey was, was fantastic. I think where EOH came, came short and, and where it all went wrong is that the company got too big for the way it was being managed and run. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was kind of being managed and run as, a, as an entrepreneurial, um, much, much smaller company, yet the company was huge mm. with thousands of people and, 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 and over 10 billion in revenue. And I think there was huge pressure on the company to continue making acquisitions and continue with the 30% growth that they had become accustomed to. And they made a couple of very bad mistakes mm. um, along, you know, in, in, in the final two or three years of that, of that high growth and, and bought the wrong companies, also got involved in projects that sucked up huge amounts of working capital. We all saw it. I mean. I was going to ask that. Did you see it coming oh, that this was oh, like a, a crash yeah. waiting to happen? Well, I, I, to be honest, I didn't think it would go from where it was. When I started seeing trouble was basically when the working capital starts shooting out, mm -hmm. which means, you know, the, the, you can just see there's just money being sucked in there. And I started saying, this is, this is crazy. Um, but we were reassured from management at the time that uh, these were bigger projects that required more capital and um, things would work out over time, etc. And And I think management often generally thought that was the case. Mm. Um, and so did we, and we gave them the benefit of the doubt because they had a 15 year impeccable track record yeah. um, as would most people. And, and I think, you know, when things started unraveling, you had all the stars aligned on the way up and when one or two things go wrong and share price starts going down, everything unravels because their whole model was around, you know, doing good small acquisitions. And that mm. in itself is actually a good model, by the yeah. way. Yeah. There's a company overseas called Constellation Software, which I think does pretty much the same thing. You could argue it's very different, but it's the same kind of model, but they, they, they've been able to do it successfully without any of these big mistakes. Right. And so, so the model's good, but I think what happened was it just got too big, uh, mm -hmm. got too big for them to manage. And uh, they made many mistakes. And there was also allegations of big corruption, as, as we found was the case. And, and it's sad, mm -hmm. but, you know, the whole thing unraveled. And, um, yeah, I didn't think it would unravel as much as it did. Um, so I, I got caught a little bit uh, myself. But when when the CEO left, um, the share price was, I think it was about 100 or 130 rand yeah. come down from the peak. Uh, that, that's when I sold a, a fair portion of my own shares. I had shares, not a lot, wish I had more, but um, but I sold when that happened. Because, was that um, when Asher Bobbitt left? Yeah, he left, yeah. I mean, you know, and then after that, things just really got bad. Mm. Um, I, I didn't sell all my shares. I sold like a third. Uh, I, I sold a third and then another third. But you know what? I mean, you know, this was just a very difficult company to predict um, when, 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 when you saw what they had been doing in the past and how, how well they did it. Mm -hmm. you, you genuinely thought that that things would would turn around and they were having a few speed bumps. Yeah. But I think when the whole corruption allegation started and then Microsoft pulled away from them because there were certain things that happened in the Microsoft space that Microsoft globally didn't like, that's when I just realized this this is not a good thing. Yeah. It was arguably too late, um, you know, uh, to get advanced warning, but 
you know, it, 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 it's a big story. EIH yeah. teaches you a story and teaches you lessons that, you know, when things are going well, you just got to always keep skeptical, yeah. um, you know, and, and I've learned a lot from that whole exercise. Mm. I think and, and, and in today, terms of the company now, I mean, obviously we know yeah, what's happened and it's collapsed, yeah. but is it, does it present an opportunity at this point or I is think, it a value trap? Is it too tainted uh, or, or not? I think it does present a, a fairly good opportunity, but I think they've got a lot of challenges um, still. You know, they, 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 they're in the final stages of trying to recapitalize themselves. So mm -hmm. there's probably going to be quite a bit of dilution um, coming. In fact, it's quite timely yes, because I think the, in the next set of results, we'll start to know exactly where we stand on that. I think the new CEO, Stephen Van Koller, um, had a lot more uh, work um, for himself than he thought he would have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he's done a fantastic job getting all the corporate governance and all those kinds of things. And, and basically putting all the, the things in place to run EOH as a much bigger business instead of a small business. Okay. And, I, and I think he has the experience to do that. But I still think, you know, from a tech point of view, they've probably um, lost a lot of traction because of all these issues that they've had to fight for the last two or three years. And, and so I think they've lost a bit of ground. Um, and, and I think also the reputational side, no matter what anyone says, you know, that, that is a, it, it is a problem because it, it, it's still there. They also are still not friends with Microsoft, which, which is a problem in today's tech ecosystem. Absolutely. If, we, if one looks at it. So, so I think they've got a lot of challenges. I mean, if you make money out of your age from here, I doubt you're going to make money like we made in, in the old year age. I think mm -hmm. you, you might do okay over the next two or three years, but I don't think it's going to be a, a, a rocket ship anytime soon. Okay. Okay, but would you be a buyer of you know for some level of a of a recovery? If I'm reading between the lines of what you sort of say, yeah, but it's still very difficult, Garth, and 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 it it's it's not a very easy one to to defend yeah. because you know there, there's still a lot of things that can go anyway. So sure. I would pro probably just say watch it and and have a look. I mean, I've had moments of enthusiasm in the past two or three years where I thought, gee, this thing really could do well. And then they'll come up with the next set of results and it just disappoints on the cash flow or something like that. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they kind of, it's a difficult one. I would say it's not, a, it's, it's not an easy one to, to guarantee over the next year or two yeah. and that they're going to do a very strong recovery. At least for me, it isn't. Yeah, no, fair enough. Yeah. But in the other company I wanted to ask you about uh, listed on the JSC is Roynet. And and the, the reason why right now it's interesting is because it seems that maybe, just maybe, the government's finally waking up to the fact that they need to open up the power generation industry. Um, and we, we were just talking off the call beforehand about load shedding and the problems with ESCOM, et cetera. Um, if they do open up the power industry in South Africa and open it up to public participation and for for public companies to pot to, to, to feed power into the grid. Royness is quite nicely positioned for that, isn't it? Because then that, that's largely what they do. They manufacture power related stuff to, for, for high high level power equipment. I mean, I'm, I'm probably screwing up how I'm saying it. So I'm going to leave no, it to no. you. But, but what do you make of Roynet at this point in time? Is that a nice opportunity if we start to see the power, in, in independent power producers in South Africa really be able to um, get some traction? Yeah, I think um, short answer is Roynet does look interesting um, at, these, uh, at this point. Roynet is also a very old company. I don't know it as well as I knew EOH, but maybe that's a good thing. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I've only started looking at Roynet more closely over the past two or three years um, because they've been including their whole RCT operation. And, in fact, one of the top uh, guys from EOH, um, Rob Godlinton, who, who actually was 
was the head of one of the, their large um, uh, units, is now the head of the one of these new RCT sections within um, uh, Roy and called Plus One X. Okay. And, and I have a lot of time and a lot of respect for Rob Godlinton. I think he's got a fantastic reputation in the industry and he, he's like a bit of a magnet in the sense that he he attracts good people. And what he's doing at Roynet, I think, is a great thing. And so I've I've kind of spent a bit more time trying to understand what Roynet is um, with, with a focus on that side of it. But recently they did do a, um, a big site visit where they put the spotlight on their um, renewable energy sections. Mm. Um, and basically what they've got is two – Two, two main areas, two or three main areas in, inside that. The one is all the solar panels um, um, and all the batteries, because essentially with, 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 with this type of stuff, you need two things. You need the solar panels and you need the batteries. Yeah. It's more for the big commercial and uh, industrial applications, not really the, the 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 residential uh, thing they they focus on the bigger the bigger ones and um, and then there's another area where what they propose to do over time is to actually take a lot of that stuff on their own balance sheet and enter into an agreement with the client where the client actually pays them a fee mm-hmm. per kilowatt hour yeah. so then effectively they become like a very microscopic version of ESCOM where, mm-hmm. where they've got their own plant and, and, they, and they've got these longer-term contracts. So it's very exciting. I mean, it's certainly flavor of the year at the moment with all the load shedding. Mm-hmm. Every, every man and his dog is, is, um, is running towards installing solar and, and inverters and batteries and all this. Um, but, but I think... The problem is that also there's a hell of a lot of competition in that area. Mm. So there's a hell of a lot of installers of all this stuff in the residential space. I mean, you you know, pretty much, I mean, you just have to scroll through your Facebook feed and you'll probably find five or six companies that you never heard of before mm. that are doing this. Okay, that's on a small level. At the more industrial level, there's not that many, but 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 there are a lot of competitors and you're really just selling third party panels um, uh, and batteries from from um, in the case of Roynet, they they've got a lot of RP in this area so I don't want to belittle them mm-hmm. and they've got a lot of um, you know, skills so you know they in terms of actually designing these systems for clients etc but you know, it's not something which is just straightforward, easy to do. Yeah. These things take time and especially the bigger installations. Uh, and then that whole part I spoke about with the balance sheet, taking it on to the, you know, paying for the stuff themselves and selling the power effectively. Mm. That's a whole new ball game. So I, I'd be more cautious about that. That's not something Roynet has done before. Um, and if you get your calculations wrong, um, you know, on that over the next five years or so, and you do too many of those deals, you you could easily find yourself coming unstuck. It's big capex. And, I was just going to say, uh, kind of, pre- so presumably, kind of model. yeah, very big capital expenditure to set that up. You've got to set up solar farms and and that type of thing. Um, yeah. It's hugely capital intensive, and your your payoff is quite a long. It's quite a long payoff, isn't it? So the, these yeah. kind of projects can ultimately can ultimately become very cash generative in the future. But there's quite a big J curve that you've got to go through in order to try yeah. and get these things to basically break even and and start to turn a profit, right? Yeah, and and so I mean I'm not an expert in that area, although I'm an electrical engineer. I I, I don't sort of even claim to be an expert in that. Mm. You know, I'm more on the on the RCT area. That's where I'm more comfortable. Okay. Um, and in that area, I think Roynet's doing great things, um, building quite a lot of things. There's a lot of synergy around some of their more traditional businesses. Um, they've got um, they've got quite a few wonderful businesses, and and I think there's a lot they can do. Um, you know, um, in 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 that area and. Yeah, it's an exciting group. 
uh, it's a big group. There's lots of moving parts there, yeah. um, and and I'm and I'm continuing to watch it very closely. It, is this a company? It's it's around forty five rand or something. Yeah. You know, is it going to shoot up in a hurry? Well, it hasn't. Mm. Um, you know, and all this energy stuff has been communicated already to mm. the market. Share hasn't shot up, which tells me that uh, informed investors are just watching it closely um, and and maybe being a bit bit cautious, which which I think is correct. You're listening to Talking with Traders, a podcast series brought to you by IG a world-leading online trading and investment provider. If you haven't checked out the IG online trading platform, please do so and visit IG.com. Also, make sure you subscribe to the podcast series on your favorite podcast app or website by clicking on the subscribe button and you'll be notified weekly as we release new episodes. So I I think we've got to watch them and they've uh, uh, they've got to prove themselves in a couple of areas. But I'm quite excited about the RCT space that they're embarking on because Roynet's never been that strong in the in the in that area that they've recently invigorated uh, with with plus one X. Right. So I'm excited about that. But okay. I mean, it's still small in their group. Uh, right. It's not it's not going to move the dial for a while. Yeah. So you know, I think it's early days. Let's keep a watch with a positive outlook. And um, and see, but I don't think it's going to run away anytime soon. Yeah, okay. I mean, I'm just looking at the long-term weekly chart of it here. I mean, it's a stock that between 2012 and 2020, it really went sideways at mm. about se- mm. between 70 and 75 rand a share. And as yeah. you say, now it's down at about 45 rand a share. That's after dipping to 30 rand a share during the bottom of the COVID crash. So yep. you know, it hasn't been a great investment for anybody over the last decade, that's for sure. No, been- and also, the, to be fair, they've had some tough businesses in the cables area and a lot of these other sort of manufacturing spaces, which mm. which I don't really enjoy focusing on, to be honest. Uh, yeah. You know, I, don't, I can analyze what, what I want as an independent. That's one of the advantages. And yes. when it comes to this type of stuff, I, I kind of, you know, it's not my area. It's not what I enjoy. So I, I shy away from it. Okay. But those areas have been quite volatile because, you know, there's currency impacts and there's commodity prices and there's a whole bunch of things. Plus the government is a big sort of infrastructure spender, which which hasn't pulled through that well over the past 10 years. Mm. Um, so I think it's it's impacted Roynet as a group. And it's a pity because they've got such good people um, that that really are, I mean, they're conservative people that know their stuff. They, they, they really are good. But I, I just think, you know, we've got to give them a bit of time and maybe this whole energy thing, is going to is going to be good for them, yeah. but you know it's competitive. It's yeah. a competitive area. Okay, I'm conscious of the time, Ernest, and we've got yeah. quite a lot of other stuff to talk to. We, we wanted sure. to really get on to some of the international things that you look at, because uh, that's where I think it's exciting. We've spoken about the fact that the JSE is, oh, it's shrinking. There's a lot of delistings. The universe is, of companies is, is is becoming smaller, and I know that as a consequence of that, you've gradually been upskilling yourself, looking at some of the offshore companies. And I mean, the fact is, there's a hell of a lot more opportunities, so many more interesting companies listed in the US. Um, and again, I mean, there's far too many to go through all of them. But there are a couple that you are uh, that you focus on, and I'd like to talk about these. And I think it's, it's timeliest to talk about the tech space in, in the US right now, because that area of the market really has witnessed quite a collapse over the last year, year and a half. I mean, I almost liken it to the the dot com bubble 2.0, in the sense mm. that you had some of these companies just got wildly overvalued leading up into you know the middle of 2021, and they've subsequently come crashing down. But there are a lot of good companies out there which now appear to be trading at much lower levels and possibly far more compelling valuations. A couple that we'll talk about, um, Snowflake is one of them, but I think you said Mm -hmm. to me that you wanted to kind of sketch the background a little bit uh, in terms of these companies that are involved in cloud computing, 
and they're laying the foundation for the future, as you as you put it. So yeah. perhaps just give us a brief background into that industry, that or that whole concept of cloud computing, and then let's dig into it a little bit more deeper. Thanks, Garth, for the opportunity. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> it's very interesting because what we're finding ourselves in today, globally is a major, major shift is underway. Um, we, we're well into that shift already, but mm -hmm. it's just continuing. And that shift is the shift from an on-premises world of IT where you buy big servers and you have your own data rooms, data centers, and you kind of um, do all your computing under your watch under your watchful eye and, and you control who accesses your data center, you then secure it with, with, with powerful firewall software um, and, and nobody else can come into this data center except for your own employees, which are on the network. And, 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 and that's pretty much how it's been. And, and, and now what's happening is these companies are shifting all that computing over to the um, to the cloud infrastructure players, and there's basically three players that dominate that area. And the first one is Amazon's AWS. Mm -hmm. The second one is Microsoft's Azure business, mm -hmm. and the third one is Google's uh, GCP or Alphabet. Um, and you know, it's amazing because 20 years ago. Round about there, 15 years. I, I'll never forget a meeting I had with one of the top IT people, uh, one of the CIOs in the first train group, who said to me, no, we will never move our, 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 our systems over to these cloud players because we can't control what they do. Uh, there's a huge security risk. And our infrastructure is bigger than, than, than some of these guys. He wasn't really talking at the time about Amazon or, 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 or Microsoft. He was talking more about the local sort of players at the time, players mm. like BCX, who also had a very interesting um, uh, uh, data center that, that was being used by many enterprises. But that was the early days. And if you advance the clock 15, 20 years, what you see today is that these companies are moving in mass to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening is they're doing it for a number of reasons. It's, it's, it's not just cost, but, but it's flexibility. The, 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 these cloud infrastructures um, such as AWS and Microsoft allow you to do things and scale up and scale down in ways that you could never dream of doing before. So if you need to do something that requires a massive amount of computing, that in the old days you would need to literally go and buy $20 million worth of servers, you can literally run it now for, um, you know, for one hour and, mm -hmm. and, and see what the outcome of that is. And you may say, oh, well, what do you need that for? Well, there's, there's huge... Um, um, I mean, there's many examples where you would need that um, doing computations to to discover new drugs, um, you know, um, working on on month end sort of um, heavy load situations, or even you know, there's there's often times where where your web server just gets totally um, um, overloaded because you've got a big event or or something like that. And today everything everything works digitally. So, um, you know, companies are finding immense benefit from going to these cloud players for their basic infrastructure. And the part that excites me, I mean, is, is obviously those infrastructure players mm. are just going to chug along and grow. I mean, it's incredible. You've got a company like Amazon's AWS or, or their division doing something of the order of $80 billion in revenue growing in the mid 40s mm. i mean i mean i i've never seen an 80 billion dollar revenue stream growing at 40 percent 
in yeah. my time as an analyst. So, so it means that 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 the clients are buying this stuff and mm. and moving quickly. And the same is happening with Azure um, and GCP. So, what I find interesting, Garth, is we know those are the the top three pillars. And they're not going to be displaced anytime soon. In fact, they're probably going to just chug along for the next 10 or 15 years and do very well. Mm. Um, and so those offer great investment opportunities, in my opinion, themselves. Um, although in the case of an Amazon, you've got to kind of take the retail business with it. Mm. And that's got also a few issues around it. So it's not always the easy in Microsoft. You've got a whole bunch of other business units uh, thrown into Azure. And the same with Google. It's it's largely an advertising-based platform. But on top of these um, core cloud infrastructure um, pillars, if you want to call it, there's, there's a whole new world of cloud software that's being created. So instead of you buying all your software to, um, to run in your own company, um, on 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 your own servers or, or wherever it might be inside your organization, you're now starting to to buy all your software in a cloud format, and that's all sitting on top of these players. So what we're seeing now is a major major, I would say it's like a a land grab where um, all these companies are 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 trying as best as possible. To, to secure as many clients as they can. And so what they're doing with a lot of these, um, we saw it with, with, with companies like Salesforce over the years where, yeah. where, 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 where they were one of the first to, to, to do all this, um, the, this new cloud model version of software, and they've done very well. But nowadays we're seeing things like Snowflake, and Snowflake is a great example because it's in the data space. And, and what this means is that companies are using Snowflake to store a lot of their data so mm. that they can do um, very smart um, analysis on that data later. And it's all sitting on top of this cloud infrastructure, which means that if you need a massive amount of computing to, to do some sifting through data in a certain way, they make it easy for you as opposed to you having done that the old method. In many cases, you wouldn't have even been able to do it in the way you can today. Mm -hmm. And though they charge you a, a, a fee based on, on how much you use their platform. And what's very interesting with Snowflake is that they're already making it possible that you can sell portions of your data to other Snowflake users. So okay. it's almost like creating an app store within their ecosystem. So it's like, it's like the Apple App Store, which we know has been wildly successful, mm. where you sell, uh, you sell third-party people can sell the apps. Here you can actually trade data between companies. And if you think in the world, um, in, in, in all these big enterprises, there's a huge amount of data that gets interchanged between companies. And, and so what this Snowflake is trying to do is trying to get as many companies onto their platform as possible over the next few years. And then the idea would be that they could then um, become extremely profitable and uh, those companies would find it very hard to switch off from that and, and move over to something else. Okay. So it's a it's a it's an incredible thing that's happening. I've given one example, but there's probably 30 or 40 other such examples where in other areas of, of tech where there's an application that's sitting on top of the core pillars mm. and they just literally trying to grow as fast as they can. And so when, when the naked eye looks at these stocks, or, or not the naked eye, but the untrained eye, you will see that, that these companies are not earning much profit. In fact, they, um, some of them are slightly uh, loss-making. Yeah. And, and, and you kind of look at this as a fundamental analysis. This is a, really a thing I've needed to kind of adjust to because these aren't things we see that often in South Africa, if at all. And, and what these companies really are doing is they're plowing all their profits back into 
uh, sales and marketing and R and D to to get better and grow faster. And so they forget they forget they're giving up all their profits now to um, to potentially be bigger than what they otherwise would have been if they were to grow slowly. And the reason yeah. for doing that is the competitors are all around them. So he, you know, with many of these markets, it's a, it's a kind of winner takes most. So, you know, if you can be the winner over a five or 10 year period, you, you potentially can become a very uh, profitable company down the line. Mm. It does take a lot of courage to invest in these companies. And so um, in, in these really, high growth companies that are that are not making profits because you kind of have to dream about what the future can be mm. um it's it, it it takes a lot of understanding and try and that's what i'm trying to do is understand which are the ones that that really have something special and which are the ones that are kind of just maybe not going to be as successful yeah uh, i guess that's, it's, it's that's very hard it's very hard yeah i mean I, I suppose like out of the the dot com bubble burst came the likes of microsoft and amazon and google and um you know but there were, were many many others that never made it and i guess the the key now is to look at this major collapse that we've seen in the tech space in the us and try and exactly do that try and sift through everything and try and find which ones could potentially be the real big players in 10 years time from now so yeah. i mean if i had to ask you and i know this is probably being a little cheeky because you do sell your research into the buy side and um yeah and and but i mean if i had to say to you just give us an, a three potential stocks that you would that, that you would like to own for 10 years in that space what would they yeah. be so I mean, I'll I'll just give a maybe a slightly, maybe slightly different answer to that question. Mm. And and the and the first point I'd make is that anybody who wants to invest um, on the stock market, I'm just literally now reversing a little bit here, mm. should you know should consider um, 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 you know where do they put their money? I mean, it's insane to have all your eggs in the South African market mm. when South Africa contributes less than 1% of the world's GDP. So, 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 so you've got to diversify as all yes. good financial analysts or financial advisors would tell you. Yeah. So if you're going to go into the U S market, you can't invest all your money in tech stocks sure. because, you know, tech is only one sector. It is a big sector. And, and I actually think over the next five to 10 years, it's going to get even bigger and more important. So it's not a bad sector to have quite a big chunk in, mm. but you, you, you can't have all your money in tech stocks. So that's the other disclaimer. But if you're going to invest in these companies a, as an individual, I think what you need to do is you need to have a few of the core pillars. So you need to have Amazon, you need to have Microsoft, potentially Google, although that's quite ad advertising uh, based, but I like them because of their underlying uh, cloud infrastructure. Mm. And then I think you need to take a, 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 a sort of a swing at, a, at, let's say, five or 10 of these high growth companies that have done incredibly well so far and that could become really strong players in the next 10 years. And hopefully one or two of them will be the next um, fantastic success story. Mm. And so I would look at companies that are literally doing the best of all of them um, in terms of their um, fundamentals and, and their product strategies. And, and, and really at the end of the day, it's not that difficult. You just look at who, who's doing very well from a revenue point of view and who's keeping their margins very tidy and things like that. It, it, it's not that difficult. Mm. Um, but, but, but I would say companies in the security space um, like CrowdStrike okay. is, a, is, a, is a phenomenal one because, you know, security is a tailwind within this broader tailwind of, of tech. And, and there's a whole, we could have a whole podcast on that alone, but, CrowdStrike is a, is a phenomenally strong company that's literally turned endpoint security on its head um, in the way they do it. 
um, in, a, in a cloud fashion. And it's sort of a crowdsourced um, fashion, um, which I won't go into the technical details of, but it's, it's quite sophisticated and very elegant the way they do it. Then I would look at a company like um, Snowflake. Right. I mean, these companies trade at very high price to sales multiples. I think Snowflake's currently north of 20. That's price to sales, sales yeah. not, not price to earnings, because many of these companies don't have earnings. Mm. So they're reinvesting all that into, um, you know, into their into their, their, their sales and marketing and their R and D. So they kind of, they're not worried about earnings right now. They are just trying to grow as fast as they can. Mm. So I would say Snowflake is a, is a company that one needs to keep an eye on. It's quite funny because Snowflake was invested in by Berkshire Hathaway yes. um, short, shortly. I mean, on their listing, uh, I think their price they got was about $120 and the share price is, is, is around those levels now. So it's quite interesting. And then I would say um, another good one to keep an eye on, I like the, the ones in the payment areas. There's two companies that, that I've been following quite closely. One's called Adien, which is actually uh, head office in Netherlands, but they're a global company. Mm. And the other one is called D Local. And, and these are companies that are powering a lot of the payments um, that are making all this e-commerce possible that we're seeing. It's a, it's a, it's a slightly, well, it's totally different to the enterprise software area because the payments is a is an animal of its own that mm. that is worthy of 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 delving into it very deeply. But I won't do that. But but these are the types of companies that I think one needs to have a little bit of exposure to because these can become monsters, um, uh, you know, over the next 10 years. And if they don't um, and, and, they, and, they, and they kind of, uh, it doesn't pan out the way one would think, um, I think one will get a uh, sort of insight into that as the quarters tick on mm. and one can kind of rotate out of these and have a few that's, that are waiting on the bench, uh, right. if you will. Yeah. So, so, so I think one's got to be very careful with this. You can't put your whole portfolio into these types of companies. Sure. But I certainly think this is where this is where the future is. I mean, yeah. this is a lot of these companies are doing things which are which are remarkable, and they're not vaporware because they they companies with with some of them have north of a billion dollars in revenue, growing at eighty percent. You know, this is a, yeah. a company like Snowflake is is of that order. Yeah. So the, these are highly successful companies. Okay. All right. Excellent. Last one I want to ask you about before we wrap it up is uh, Zoom. Now, we're obviously, we're conducting this interview on Zoom. And uh, it's a company that's gone, but obviously it, it was a huge beneficiary during the COVID pandemic when everybody was working from home. And the stock price went absolutely bananas. I mean, it went from $70 to $600 during the pandemic. It's now sitting all the way back down at, at about $80 a share. So it's down 85% from its peak. Now, I, mean, I know that's quite a, a, a headline to state uh, and perhaps a little bit um, sensational. But you you argue that it should not, never have been $600 in the first place. But where do we stand now? I mean, at these valuations, how do you see Zoom? Do you think it's an opportunity for investors or do you worry that it's the, the type of company that's going to get gobbled up or cannibalized by the likes of Teams from Microsoft um, or Google Meet from, from Google? Oh, I think um, just a few points, if I may. Firstly, when you touched on it, that it's quite a sensational headline to say you're down 85%. Um, that is exactly what I think. You know, why, you know, with a lot of these stocks, they can be down 70%. So you think, ooh, this is potentially um, good value we're getting in right at the bottom. But, you know, the problem is who says that the peak that they reached was correct in the first place? In fact, in most cases, it, it, it was crazy. It, it was totally ludicrous. Um, some of these companies were trading on, on price to sales multiples of 100, which if you do the numbers, 
I mean, you, you would need to really grow, you know, at phenomenal rates for like 20 years or 10 years or 15 years to get a good investment return out of these companies. So, so you know, w- w- the fact that the share price has dropped so much is actually totally insignificant because the marker where it came from kind of didn't really have much meaning. Mm. All that marker had was, was that a lot of people maybe got carried away and thought that the pandemic would stay for a lot longer and, you know, Zoom was, was their, their brand knowledge had literally shot to the roof in, in a few months when every single person knew what Zoom was. Mm. In fact, sometimes when you do a Teams meeting, you still say, you know, well, let's arrange a Zoom. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind it's, of become it's, a noun. It's, so. Yeah, it's become a noun, or, yeah, yeah. A noun like, like Google, you know. Yeah, or, 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 or Google, <laughs> it means you'll search for something. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think, so let's answer the question where we are now. I mean, look, the one thing interesting about Zoom, which is very different to some of these other companies we spoke about a few minutes earlier, is that Zoom, actually has very strong cash flows um, for, 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 you know, for, 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 for when you compare to some of the other companies, they've got very good uh, free cash flow. Okay. And the other thing about them that's good is that they've got this mind share. So pretty much everyone uses like Zoom or has used Zoom or currently still uses Zoom. So like I use Basically, when the pandemic started, I pretty much only used Zoom. Um, and over time, you know, about the, over the next year, I was using more and more Teams. And now I'm probably 50-50. Um, I'll use whatever the client wants or, or the other person feels more comfortable with. Mm-hmm. I still find Zoom a lot easier to use on an iPhone or an iPad, um, whereas Teams is quite good in an enterprise setting. And a lot of the big sort of clients that have got, you know, you know, Zoom, uh, sorry, they've got Microsoft Teams, then they they just use it because there's certain things they can do with it. So so it's still it's still there and it's and it's still being used. They've now got this whole Zoom phone, which is um, which is a, 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 a relatively new product, and and they're doing pretty well with it. And and also they've got, you know, they're trying to build an ecosystem around their product where where people can build other apps and integrate it into this whole Zoom experience. So, mm. But they've got very, very, very stiff competition. Um, so I would say, yeah, we're not going to see $600 anytime soon. In fact, probably never. Mm. Um, but, but the other thing that Zoom's got going for it, and this is a part I wanted to talk about, is the... CEO um, Eric Kwan is is totally focused on this product and this company. Whereas if you go to look at Teams, you, you know I don't know the person in charge of the Teams product within the Microsoft um, um, empire, but it's 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 certainly not a person who staked his entire life on on something. And if you read the the story of the Zoom CEO and how he came to the US and worked his way into Cisco and then eventually wanted to improve on Cisco's um, meeting product. And and they said, no, they don't want to change certain things. And he just went on and started his own company and look what he's managed to achieve. Mm. This is a very driven person. And so um, he, he seems to be incredibly passionate about what he's doing. So I'm not saying that Zoom is going to take over the meeting space anytime soon, but you never know. They might hang on to a very decent market share Mm. and over the next three or four years do some very interesting tie-up. They almost bought 5.9. It didn't uh, didn't work out, but um, they might make an acquisition down the line. So I I think it's exciting, but I don't think it's going to rocket up um, anytime soon okay. uh, or, or even remotely back to that 600 level that we saw. Okay. All right. 
Well, Ernest, we, we're pretty much out of time now. So uh, it's been great talking to you and getting a couple of stock ideas. I mean, just to recap, we've spoken about EOH and Roynet in the South African context. And then offshore, we've spoken about uh, Snowflake, CrowdStrike, um, Adyen, D local, and, and now obviously we've spoken about Zoom. So the listeners have got some good insights from you on all of those companies. You're an independent analyst, as we've said. So you and you're not typically well known in the public space, really, uh, because you you predominantly work within with very select clients. But having said that, how can listeners follow your work if they yeah. are, are interested in following what you do? No, thanks for the opportunity. I think the best way is to follow me on Twitter, which is my first name and surname, Ernest Kaplan, and it's Ernest with an I yep. and Kaplan with a K, and then my LinkedIn profile. And wh what I do is I use Twitter a lot to discuss the results that are coming out or that have just come out, uh, also to to try and connect with investors and people from the industry globally. And mm -hmm. I mean, if you follow me, you're not going to get a newsletter or a, or a, a regular a post or, or something which is going to tell you what to buy, but you're certainly going to follow some of the questions that I'm trying to ask and it will probably give you an idea of, um, you know, the kind of, um, that I'm doing in the space. So, so come join me, ask me questions here and there. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to engage with people and, and follow me on LinkedIn. I, I don't post as much on LinkedIn. I find Twitter is a, is a hell of a lot more um, uh, uh, immediate mm. in terms of the responses you get, but, but I'm still on LinkedIn every now and then I'll, I'll, Put something interesting on that I found. So, so that's where people I think can can engage with me. Excellent. All right, super, Ernest. Well, thanks again for your time. It's been wonderful chatting to you and getting your insights on this sector that you are number one rated analyst for in South Africa. It's been good chatting to you, and I look forward to you catching up again. Thanks very much, Garth. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Talking With Traders, brought to you by IG, a world-leading CFD provider. We really are privileged to have such a leader in the field of online trading involved in this series. Please follow us on Facebook and engage with us there. And a reminder to make sure you subscribe to this series by clicking on the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we'd also appreciate if you'd leave a review on the app too. Till next time.